Welcome to this week's episode of Dylan's Vlog and Podcast. Thanks for tuning in. Thanks for downloading this week's uh, episode. Hopefully you get some value out of it. If this is the first time you're listening, just a recap that I'm an entrepreneur, own a bunch of businesses, some old school traditional businesses, um, some virtual technology type stuff. And um, every day I'm out there looking to uh, serve the teams that work under my care, trying to create valuable and profitable businesses. And once a week, I jump on uh, my podcast to try and share some thoughts in hopes that uh, it's helpful for other entrepreneurs that find themselves in this in the same place that I'm in. Um, and also to connect with other entrepreneurs that are running businesses and have ideas and are looking for somewhere to share them. And I'm uh, I love talking about business, love entrepreneurship in particular, and um, have spent virtually my entire career working with business owners and entrepreneurs. And so every week I get to do this in hopes that it finds its way into the ears of entrepreneurs that could really benefit from it. And today, I, just a couple of things I want to talk about. I want to talk about two, two things going on in the marketplace that um, I was I, I, I use to sort of consider my own actions as a business owner. And even though these are publicly traded companies, I think there is something to take away for even the sort of average small business owner. And then I'd like to break into another page from my personal playbook that I've used over the years to turn around companies and to fix them up. And that is the 80-20 rule for business owners. So I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about that as well. So let's get right into the news. And there's a publicly traded company called Coinbase. They are responsible for being the custodian of cryptocurrency. And with the recent week's stock market activity, stock market has, of course, gone in the toilet, as have cryptocurrencies. And there was an announcement like two weeks ago that Coinbase was looking to rescind a bunch of job offers that it had given to engineers that it, and developers that were coming to work for them. And they just said, look, 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 turns out we're not going to need you. So we are rescinding the job offer that we extended to you. Um, and you were excited about accepting and maybe may have already shifted your life around to accommodate this new job you thought you were getting. And sorry about that, but it's just not going to happen. And then today, as it turns out, uh, Coinbase announced that not only did they rescind job offers, but they are laying off 18% of their workforce. So the reason why I think this is significant is because, in my experience, a uh, business owner can oftentimes... Um, not realize they're in trouble until they're already in the muck. And what that looks like usually starts with cash. So someone in the organization will put their hand in the air and say, hey, we're running out of money. And the business owner won't understand how that's possible because as far as they were concerned, everything was perfect and yada, 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 yada. So then they start making reactive decisions and um, begin trying to figure out how they're going to maintain their footing. Some entrepreneurs will enter that moment and look to make the adjustment and ultimately uh, turn around their situation, whereas other entrepreneurs will just continue to move forward in disbelief every day, or they just don't know what to do. They might be aware of the problems and the challenges that are being presented in their business to them every day, but they just don't have a strategy or they're not really sure how to get through it. And so first of all, that's what I've spent most of my career doing, certainly the back half of it so far. And if that's your business, I'd love to talk to you because i got lots of ideas and ways in which I can help you work through the moment to Make sure you don't fold into it, but to give you some solace as a business owner, you're not alone in trying to figure out how to navigate a difficult time. Coinbase is a publicly traded company, and not only did it was just two weeks ago that they were rescinding job offers, this week they're actually laying off 18% of their staff, which just goes to show you that even if you're a publicly traded company with a lot of smart people working for you, that you're still human and you are still subject to the things that affect all of us disbelief, being over optimistic, um, not making decisions quickly enough, getting out in front of your skis, all of those sorts of things. And I think that the CEO over at Coinbase, it'd be tough for him for, I believe it would be tough for him to say that he wasn't aware that they were going to need, need to make these changes. Because if that is in fact true, then that just goes to show you how well that business is managed. And just to give you maybe a different, a different part of the spectrum to consider. When you look at really big companies, and I'll use an oil and gas company that we're all familiar with, Exxon Mobil, you know, you never hear about them laying off, first of all, never hear about them rescinding job offers in a public news announcement. 
Um, and you just wouldn't hear about that. And you also wouldn't hear about them laying off 18% of their workforce in kind of one sudden swipe. So that just goes to show you that it is possible to manage a business well. And even though the markets change, you can adjust. But I think, you know, in that line, don't be that entrepreneur. Don't be that entrepreneur that is reacting to your circumstances. If you have your head in the sand, take your head out of the sand, look around, figure out what's going on. Inflation is real. Price changes are coming. The market is shifting. Um, and as we get into that whole 80-20 rule later in the episode, I'll see, I'll, I'll I'll share with you some thoughts on how you can get ahead of that, but don't be that entrepreneur that, that puts people's lives in that position. Um, I've been a part of a lot of tough situations and I've always found that honesty is the best policy. And the truth is that if your business is struggling, many times your staff already know it. The people that you're, you're put in place to lead are already very much aware that things are difficult and it's easier just in my experience, just to hit, hit those things head on, but also be aware of them as you're moving towards making decisions about them. And so if the company is starting to experience a little bit of turbulence, just be open about that. And as you work through the turbulence, you might have to make some tough decisions, but at least you're able to do that during turbulence instead of when the plane is actually going down, much less when it's like a couple of feet from hitting the ground. And now what you've done is you haven't given your team and you haven't given people in your company the opportunity to adjust and make plans for their life. And so I've always made it a policy of being open and transparent, partly because that's my personality and I just like getting in front of things. I don't like burying my head in the sand. That's never served me well as a business principal. Um, but more importantly, it's because there are people who have real responsibilities in their life. Uh, they have groceries, they have uh, families, they have commitments, they have things in their life that they need to take care of. And the longer you can give them to plan for those things, the better. Um, as recently as last week, there was uh, somebody in our organization that we we just came to an agreement that they just weren't right for our business anymore. And instead of it being very frustrating and filled with angst, I was able to say, look, it's just not a fit. You've been here for a couple of years and it just looks like it's not working for you anymore. And maybe that part of it is us because we're, we're a hard business to work inside of. We have a very particular kind of person that flourishes in our environment and someone that is, is um, not able to do that. And it looks like you might be one of those people, but hey, how can we help you? Can we give you an extra week of wages? Can we extend your health benefits for you? What do we need to do? And he didn't, you know, the meeting didn't even start with him being fired or him anticipating he'd be let go. But as we talked through it, it turns out he was already kind of looking at other opportunities and, um, you know, I didn't want us to end on a poor note because we're in an industry where our brand matters, our reputation really matters. And I think when you look at a company like Coinbase, making the kind of decisions they're doing, it's going to be hard to attract new people. Whereas I'm hoping that in the way we conduct ourselves with our teams, that even if someone leaves us, they still speak very highly of us. And that gives us, that affords us the opportunity to continue to attract high quality people. So out of the news, Coinbase, even though you might not have an interest in cryptocurrency uh, or the public market, there's a, an example of a big company run by a lot of smart people that still make very common mistakes that um, we as entrepreneurs and small business owners should work really hard not not to emulate. And then I think that kind of flows into the other conversation piece I wanted to talk about with Netflix um, having been down 70%, I think, from a share price. Um, and again, it's not, you know, I don't do this every week because I'm a stock expert or a public market, but I think that the markets, the public markets give us some real insights into a bigger version of what we all might be experiencing as small business owners. And so Netflix share value has dropped by 70% because it turns out that the number of customers they were serving with the war in Russia and Ukraine, as well as COVID, it looked like they, they were rock stars doing a lot of business. And it turns out that they were only doing that kind of business because there was a window in the market or there was a window that they took advantage of where people were at home um, where they were able to just, you know, binge watch more stuff. Anyway, the reason I share this, uh, this particular point about Netflix having dropped 70% is because, again, if you've listened to this podcast for a while, this isn't a new idea that I'm bringing forward, but I think it's one that is worth repeating because I'm being reminded of this uh, this week as well in one of our businesses is that 
the unique thing that your business is doing that might have helped you um, build a brand, build a reputation, build a user base, et cetera, that unique thing oftentimes becomes uh, less unique with more time that passes. And so Netflix uh, had a unique thing in that they would, first of all, mail you a DVD and that evolved into online streaming before online streaming was even a thing. And so they were able to capture the rights to movies and stream them online because at the time no one was doing that. No one thought it was a thing. Then it became a thing. Then Disney did it. Uh, then Apple did it. Then Paramount did it. Then Fox did it. And all of a sudden everyone's in the streaming business. And instead of allowing Netflix to use their content, they just said, well, shoot, we can do this. We can put up a website and start streaming our own content. We don't need to license it out to Netflix anymore. So Netflix, having seen that coming, decided, well, guess what? We're going to get into the content creation business. Well, what does that sound like? That sounds like every other movie studio in Hollywood and in the world. You produce a piece of content, you distribute it through movie theaters, you get a bunch of ticket sales, then you sell it through DVDs and, and movie uh, VHS tapes, <laughs> and then you look to merchandise uh, the characters and you collect royalties and licensing. Guess what Netflix is about to do? It's about to go down that road. So that window of uniqueness that allowed their share price to go all the way up to $700 a share or something like that, um, down to where it is now at a, what, 169 or something like that, just goes to show you that while they were unique, there was money to be made, but they didn't work hard uh, hard enough or quickly enough to understand that everything ends up re uh, falling back down to kind of like the historical average. And guess what? The movie studio model is a well-defined model. Streaming has just allowed for a different form of distribution, but movie studios have always had to figure out a way to distribute their content. And Netflix just had an edge on the market that is now gone, and now they're struggling to figure that out. So that's the backstory to Netflix, but what does it mean to you and me? What it means to you and me is, first of all, we should always be looking for that unique competitive advantage that allows us to gain um, a better foothold in the marketplace or allows us to take some market share away from the market leaders. Um, and ultimately, with one eye to realizing that that unique opportunity is not going to last forever, that while it's in front of us, we need to leverage it, but we've got to have a game plan to either continue to be unique or understand that at some point that unique uh, feature is not going to be available to us anymore. And so our, we better have built a good war chest or we better have built a very profitable business that can run without that unique feature because the rest of the market's going to absorb that. And as it turns out, I've seen this many times in my own experience working with local businesses or businesses that um, took advantage of of an opportunity to solve a problem for customers. They did it in a way that no one else was doing it. They were able to capitalize on that way, but then they never figured out a way to evolve. And so ultimately their business ended up atrophying. And because of the kind of work I've done over the last couple of years, these businesses ultimately became, if not bankrupt, then just surviving on life support because they could never figure out what their second act was and they kept living off of past glories. So uh, between... Coinbase and Netflix, I think the public market gives us an exaggerated version of the problems and the challenges that us small business owners, entrepreneurs are facing. And it's also instructful for us to spend a little bit of time sort of thinking through it because we can apply those lessons to our own business. And for me, the lesson in Netflix is that there's truly nothing new under the sun. There are windows of time when there are different ways to do old things, but then those, those different ways become the old way of doing it and someone else comes along and builds on the idea and so you can't rest on your competitive advantage for too long and you do need to spend some time figuring out how to work away from that and there are different strategies uh, to do that um, so maybe I'll spend a podcast episode talking about that uh, but a couple things to think about there don't be that entrepreneur that is making reactive decisions and affecting people's lives in a very negative way when the truth is you're probably in the best position to make better decisions and that's maybe style over substance. And then the second thing is realize that whatever competitive advantage you have today, make the most of it, but also have one eye towards what are we going to do when that competitive advantage just becomes commonplace and um, we're going to need to find either a different thing to do or we're going to figure out a way to leverage our advantage while we have it into building a brand, into building an identity and, and so forth.
So those are the two news things I wanted to talk about. Um, and then the last kind of big conversation piece I wanted to, uh, to discuss was the 80-20 rule for entrepreneurs. Again, I've talked about this a little bit in past episodes. I'm going to just spend a little bit more time talking about it now. And here's kind of the, the general idea. Now, 80-20 is very broad. So inevitably, someone's going to send me a message and say, Dylan, it's not actually 80-20. It's more like 90-10 or it's more like 60-40 doesn't matter what the math is. The concept is the same. And here's the concept. The concept is, so the 80-20 rule for business owners is that 80% of the business is done by 20% of the companies in a marketplace, which means that the remaining 20% of business done in a market is done by 80% of the companies in that same marketplace. So that means that generally speaking, leaders of the market have the best margins because they're doing the lion's share of the business to be done. Anyone else in the marketplace has the worst margins because they're just scrapping it out to try and figure out how do they survive. The margin, whether you look at gross margin or net margin, doesn't really matter. Margin simply means profitability. And that means that if you're a business that is a leader, that means that you are earning a disproportionate amount of margin for every customer you serve compared to a follower in that marketplace, which is just grinding it out every day to try and survive. So one of the first things to ask yourself as an entrepreneur is where is our company? Are we part of the 20%, meaning we're a leader in our given market, or we're part of the 80% and we are a follower? And to be clear, there's nothing wrong with either. I have found this helpful as an entrepreneur when trying to figure out how do I create more value inside of a business. And the first place I start is by going, where does our business fit in in the general market? And so um, what does this mean for, say, the 20%, the, the leaders of the marketplace? Well, the 20% the leading the marketplace, they have um, better purchasing power because of the volume that they do, which helps them have better margin. They have uh, a bigger user base. So because they have a user base, they have uh, more consistency and predictability in their revenue, and they're able to uh, plan uh, their businesses better than a, bar a market or a business that is following the market leader. Um, and of course, as I just said, the, the companies that are leaders, they simply have the best margin. So the challenge, however, because the great thing about business is it never stands still. Business is always moving. It's a very competitive game. Uh, is that growth ends up becoming very hard to find if you're a market leader. And so once you've reached the top, you have to figure out a way to keep feeding the machine and looking for new places to grab more opportunity. Otherwise, the business begins to atrophy. And I think there's lots of examples of that in the marketplace. But when we think about a market leader, um, you know, you can think of companies like Apple, you can think of companies like Walmart, like these are the companies that lead their space um, and they, they earn the best margin possible in that space. Um, but they also have to keep figuring out how to grow their business and offer new things in order to stay relevant and to maintain their position because you can't just become the market leader, stay there forever simply by being present. You do have to be very strategic and intentional about what you're doing. So if you're a market leading company and you want to avoid that pitfall of having to feed the machine, what does that mean you have to do? Well, you've got to figure out a way either vertically, either vertically or horizontally to leverage opportunities that, or to create opportunities that leverage the purchasing power of whatever it is that your product or service allows you to do. You also have to invest in improving the customer experience that allows you to build a moat um, around your customer and it makes it harder to leave them. And kind of the classic example of that one would be, well, in the first example, the classic, exa classic example would be you sell an iPhone, you sell um, a unique charging cable for that iPhone, right? So you get to earn a little bit of money there. And if you have a pile of kids like I do, you're constantly losing chargers and you curse every single time you got to send Apple 40 bucks for like a white cable. But investing in improving the customer experience and building a moat around your business would look like having a unique piece of data that only your company has that your customers, if they left you, they would have to leave that data behind. And so part of the experience of you know, what you do um, with Apple for me as an example would be maybe like the keychain password. If I were to ever leave Apple and the iOS software that they make, 
I'd have to like go figure out all my gazillions of passwords that I've had over the last decade that Apple just has stored for me. So that would, that would make it hard for me to make a switch. And then the other thing to do is to um, find opportunities to expand your margin because growth doesn't come for free. In fact, growth, growth is very expensive and for a business that has never done that before. So if you think about like the cash flow quadrant, which I, I've talked about on the last couple of episodes, when your business finally moves from struggling to adjusting to growing, the very first thing that most business owners realize is that uh, growth doesn't come at kind of a linear cost structure. There are, there are just unforeseen or unanticipated costs that arise from growth that your business would have never experienced uh, before growing. And, and the example that I always use uh, is if you work in one city and then you think, oh, well, we did it really well in this city. Let's go work in another city. As soon as, if you've ever done that before, what you realize is it's never a straight, uh, a straight decision to do that. It's never a straight cost to do that. There are always unanticipated or unforeseen costs that arise when you grow. And so as a business that's, if your business is leading in the market, then you have to figure out a way to expand your margin um, because your margins will just naturally get compressed with growth. Um, you don't get to earn the same type of margins at a million dollars, or sorry, at $10 million that you were earning at a million dollars, because typically at $10 million, you have greater costs and other costs that you didn't anticipate having when you were just at a million dollars. So that's for sort of what a company should do if they're in a leadership position. Now let's talk a little bit about a company that I think is most of the small businesses out there. Certainly it's why I believe most small businesses fail is because they, they don't become a market leader in any kind of niche they become they're just a a business that was exciting for a few years but then they start to realize that they're not making any real money the reason why they're not making any real money is because there isn't any real money to be made because all of the real money is being made by the one or two market leaders in their marketplace so they don't have the purchasing power so that means that the small business is struggling and fighting to just maintain margins they don't have the user base because they are constantly fighting for customers based on price, which then means that they're fighting for margins. Um, and they don't have the margins to maintain the fight because they end up retaining, um, say, the people or they end up hiring people that they over leverage um, because they can't afford to hire more people to do the job. So as an example, you might put someone on salary for 40 hours a week, but generally they're working 45 hours a week. And in one hour, in one week, that doesn't seem to mean a lot, but every week they're just tacking five more hours on to their day that a company isn't necessarily paying for. And the reason they're not paying for it is because they, A, they don't know that that's what's happening or B, they don't have the money to pay for it. And they just expect that the employee will make up the difference. And so everything in a business that's a follower business, a follower to the leader is difficult and it's a fight, but there is hope. So much like a business that is leading the marketplace doesn't get the opportunity to stay there for free. There are things they need to do to, to stay there. A company that is uh, classified in, in this example as a follower, they're following the market leader. What do they do? Well, the first thing you can do is you can take that big market that you work in and instead of trying to service everybody in that marketplace, you can redefine the market. So if there are a hundred or say there's a thousand customers in your marketplace that want your particular, that uh, generally want the particular product or service that you provide. If you're able to take those thousand and then cut it down and redefine, say, a hundred of them, so take 10% of the marketplace, redefine it, and then say, that is our market and we can be the leader of that market, then that becomes a niche in which you can lead. And depending on how you define that market niche and, and what you end up doing to service it, you might find that you could become the leader in that niche and then start to benefit from all of the things that come from being a market leader. And again, a market leader, uh, as I define it, would be a company doing most of the business that's available in that niche or in that market space, as opposed to just fighting for whatever's left. So you can redefine the market and find a niche that you can become the leader in. You can redefine the margin by improving the experience so that you can, you know, charge more, or you can improve the process so that you can utilize people better. And this is pretty classic of where software is a great advantage. So in a simple example, let's say it takes you a staff of three people to service a hundred customers. 
Well, if you can use software to um, service, say, 200 customers because the three people are doing a job that isn't really high value. A lot of it is maybe just moving information or data around, or maybe you just don't have data or information and you're able to put software in place. Then it means those three people can be utilized in a different way to do a different job that helps you service more customers. And so an example for my business would be, we used to have somebody that would manually create um, uh, work orders would manually put um, technicians on and off of those work orders. Then when the work order was done, kind of, you know, spend a bunch of time fixing it up. Well, we put a bunch of software in place to do all of that. So the mechanic puts himself on and off of a work order. They track their time. They're incentivized based on how well they spend their time. And the human being that used to do all of that manual work is now available to spend a couple hours a week calling new customers or following up with old customers and asking for more business. So cost structure doesn't change, but by improving um, the process, it allowed us to utilize people better, which al allowed us to redefine our margins so that we didn't need to drop our prices when, or sorry, we didn't need to increase our prices when everyone else in the marketplace was doing that over the past half year. Um, and then what else can you do if you happen to be a follower company? You've redefined the market, and you found a niche that you can be the leader in, you have made your business processes better by improving the experience um, or using technology to take out some of the operational drag, then the other thing that you can do is over-service your user base. So develop a brand or a reputation that gets people talking because whether you are a solo entrepreneur and it's just you or you're running a small business with a team of people, Generally speaking, people want to work with people. Customers want to work with businesses that they relate to, that take care of them. And in order for them to maybe go to the competition, if you've done a great job at creating a great reputation, you've treated customers the way your particular type of customer gets treated the way they want to get treated, that would speak to your brand. And between brand and reputation, that's a bit of a moat that you can put around your business so that it makes it hard for someone to come and take that customer. So. This 80-20 rule, again, has served me really well as a business owner because it has forced me to evaluate the competition, evaluate the businesses that I'm responsible for, and then start to put together strategies and tactics that help us either A, work towards becoming a leader, or, in my example, fighting to create a brand new niche and redefining the type of customer that we serve, let go of customers that don't fit that, that uh, profile anymore, and then work double time to try and find new customers that do fit that profile. And so far that's worked uh, very well, but I thought uh, that might be worth cracking into a little bit. I've spoken about the 80-20 rule before, but never really at the kind of level I did in the last couple of minutes here. And if you're an entrepreneur or business owner, you want to kick it around with your business, Dylan, not sure if my business is part of the 80, if it's part of the 20. I kind of conceptually understand what you're saying, but maybe just like, here's the business I'm in. How do I become... How do I develop a niche? How do I become the leader in that niche? What are some strategies I can be using so that I'm not struggling to just survive and maintain my margin and service customers, that I can actually build the business that works for me and, and or my team and that we can build something very valuable here. So I love those kind of conversations, so reach out. Um, I'd be happy to give you some ideas. Again, they're not perfect. I can just share with you what I've learned and what I've discovered through my efforts to do all of this. And um, I think that brings this episode to an end. So thanks for hanging out. Hope you hope you were able to get some value out of that. So make sure to subscribe, hit the bell, give a review, give a rating, share it, tell someone that, hey, there's this guy, Dylan, who's an entrepreneur that runs these businesses. And every week he just yammers on about a bunch of stuff. Maybe you'd find it interesting. Maybe connect with him. Talk to him about your business. Give him some feedback on what he's talking about because maybe in the process you're going to learn something too. So thanks for tuning in. Thanks for being a part of this week and I hope you tune in next week as well.